In this video, I want to share with you several pieces of bad mixing advice that if you've been listening to these, they're almost certainly ruining your mix and leading to you feeling frustrated and confused about the whole process. There's so much content online and tutorials on places like YouTube that you can watch if you want to get better at producing and mixing. And whilst that's amazing to have access to all of this information, a lot of it can be really confusing and just downright BS. And that's just going to lead to you getting frustrated and confused. And it's just going to take you longer to ultimately get to where you want to be if you're listening to a lot of this terrible advice. I watched a ton of tutorials when I was learning how to produce and mix. And whilst many of these did help, a lot of them just stalled my progress. They just led to me feeling really frustrated and like I was doing something wrong because I should be doing things a certain way or following certain rules. Well, I'm here to tell you that all of that is just complete nonsense and I want to bust some of those myths when it comes to mixing. You'll never hear me in any of my videos tell you that this is the only way that you should do something because ultimately, if something sounds good, it is good and you should trust your gut. It doesn't matter how you got there. However, I do want to give you an insight into my process and also hopefully give you some reassurance that if you've been following some of this bad advice online, you're not doing things wrong. So let's dive in and let's take a look at this mix. So this is quite a heavy pop punk style song. I'm gonna play you a short section and then we'll break down what's going on. Okay, so first off, this mix is sounding great. However, to get to this point, I have broken so many of these so-called rules that you might see online and you might get told that you have to do things a certain way. And I'm just here to tell you that that's just completely wrong. And let's start with the first one and probably the one that bugs me the most, and that is gain staging. Please don't let anyone tell you that there are rules when it comes to gain staging and you have to be hitting your plugins or your hardware at a certain level in order for it to sound good. There are no rules when it comes to this and it is 100% completely dependent on the source, what it is you're mixing and the sound that you're going after. I'm gonna show you two examples of where I'm using the exact same plugin but gain staging them completely differently just because I'm after a certain sound. And that is a tape plugin. Now I use tape all over my mixers. I've got tape on the guitars. I've got tape on the snare here. And I've also got tape on the two bus, on the mix bus. And they're all gain staged completely differently. Let's take a look at the snare. So the first plugin on my snare is this virtual tape machine from Slate. Let's have a look at how hard we're hitting this. So as you can see, we're driving into this plugin quite hard. We've got the input cranked up and even every so often we're seeing the red light come on. Now we're not freaking out about that because ultimately it sounds great. This is what the snare sounded like without any processing at all. It's fine, but my word, that needs help if it's gonna come out in the mix. It's way too dark, it needs some brightness. and. I like the sound of tape on drums. I want the drums to sound like they were recorded to tape. So that's what we're doing here. We've got the tape machine on and then we're just adding some EQ, quite a hell of a lot of top end actually, um, and just a touch of compression to get the snare to where it wants to be. But we are gain staging into this plugin to drive it quite hard because I want that effect from the tape. If we pull back on it, that is going to affect the sound. We're going to hear less of that tape sound. We're gonna hear less of that kind of smoothness in the top end. That's not what we want. I want to hear more of that. So we gain staging into this plugin to a point where it sounds good and what we're after, essentially. Now, a completely different example of the exact same plugin is on the mix bus. We've got a few things happening here. We've got a little bit of EQ, we've got some mix bus compression, and then tape is one of the last plugins before we're hitting the limiter. And as you can see, on this instance, 
I'm pulling way back on the input. That's because every single track is going through this plugin. It's on the mix bus. And whilst we do want the sound of tape, we need to make sure that it's too much. If we drive the entire mix too hard into this plugin, it's gonna start to break up. We're gonna start to hear a little bit too much distortion in a way that's just not pleasant. We need to make sure that we're getting the right amount of it. So let's take a listen, let's see where we're hitting this plugin, and also we'll drive the input so you can hear what happens when we're hitting it too hard. Okay, so you could hear how nasty that sounded when we cranked the input too much. That's because we're not gain staging this plugin right. We're hitting it far too hard. We're getting too much distortion. The drums are just turning to mush. We're losing all of the attack and the transient information from the kick and the stare. It just doesn't sound good. So we're gonna gain stage the plugin to a level that does sound good. Right about there is the sweet spot. That is gain staging. As you can see, exact same plugins, two different circumstances. We gain staging them completely differently. If we'd have followed a lot of the advice online that you have to be hitting your plugins at minus 18 or whatever, well, it wouldn't sound as good as what it does because we wouldn't be getting the effect from the tape that we wanted. So there are no rules when it comes to gain staging. Just listen to the sound. If you want more of that effect, if it's an analog model plugin like tape, like an SSL EQ or a console or something like that, listen to the sound, drive more into it, see how far you can push it, take it away, see what that does to the sound, and then find the sweet spot. That's what gain staging is all about. There is no rule. Okay, onto the second piece of bad mixing advice that you just shouldn't listen to. And this is about headroom when you mix in. A lot of places online, and I've even heard of mastering engineers telling people that they should be submitting their mixers at a certain level. Your mixers must be hitting minus six, minus eight dB. And it's just complete rubbish. There is absolutely no difference to your mix, whether it's hitting minus six, minus two, minus one, minus eight, it really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters when you're mixing is that you keep an eye on your master level and it is not clipping. As long as you're not going above zero, then you're fine. If a mastering engineer gets your mix and they need it to be louder, then they want to push more level into their gear, into their plugins, or well, they can just clip gain your mix up. It takes less than a second to do that. Equally, if your mix is a little bit too hot and they want some more headroom, they can just clip gain it down. It really, really doesn't matter. Now on my mix bus, I do have a limiter. A couple of reasons. I do like to mix into a limiter in the later stages of the mix just to hear how it's responding to it. I do the bulk of the mix without the limiter at all, but just to see how it's gonna sound when it's mastered, I will put it on. Another thing that I like to do is when I'm exporting the mix to send to the client for them to review it, I like to put the limiter on and just get it up to a reasonable level. I'm not gonna crush it with the limiter. I just wanna get it up to an acceptable level so that they can kind of get a flavor of what it's gonna sound like when it's mastered. However, when I'm then sending this to the mastering engineer, I'm gonna take that limiter off. I'm gonna leave everything else as it is, the EQ, the compression, the tape, everything else, that is an inherent part of the mix. And if I take that off, the mix is gonna fall apart. It's gonna drastically change it. But the limiter is just doing level. So headroom really doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're not clipping. Okay, onto the third piece of bad mixing advice. And I wanna talk about subtractive EQ. There's many tutorials, you'll see lots of people, various places online saying, when it comes to EQ in your mix, you should never boost, only ever cut. And this is really just a terrible piece of advice that you should completely ignore. Now, I believe this piece of advice originated decades ago when engineers were recording to tape. Before the advent of DAWs, people had to record to tape. Tape can inherently be noisy, can have a lot of hiss on it. And if you were boosting, particularly if you were boosting high end, let's imagine you wanted vocal to really sparkle and really shine. So you grab your EQ, you boost some 5K, 10K shelf, whatever. You're in danger at that point of introducing a lot of the hiss that comes with tape. So there was this advice back then when you were recording to tape that rather than boosting, 
you might be better to cut because if you cut out the the mid frequencies you can get the illusion of it sounding like you've done a high boost but without introducing more of the hiss and it wasn't even a rule back then it was just a piece of advice for people to take on board if they found that they were battling noise but nowadays we're all recording with pristine converters with great digital audio interfaces noise just isn't a thing anymore and if you're in a mix and you're battling against any sort of noise hiss or hum then there's something drastically wrong earlier on in the process earlier on in your chain and you should go back to your recording setup figure out what's causing that and fix it there rather than having to deal with it in the mix. So really, when you're mixing and you're EQing, it really doesn't matter if you're boosting or cutting. You're not going to be in any danger of introducing noise or hiss. And actually, to take all of this a step further, when I'm mixing, I very rarely cut. To be honest with you, I am more often than not boosting. And here's why. A lot of the time, I'm using EQs that model analog equipment. I love SSL EQs, Neve EQs, API EQs, and things like that. And these EQs have a sound. An SSL EQ has a gorgeous saturation to the mid-range. Um, a Neve is brutal. Honestly, if you boost the mid-range or that high shelf on a Neve, it has a sound you get this saturation you get these harmonics you just get a lot of flavor from that particular unit from the circuitry the transformers and all of that stuff and if you only ever cut you're never going to benefit from any of that stuff you might as well just use a really clean eq like the stock one in your daw or something like fab filter now these are great and i'm not saying don't use them absolutely i use the stock eq i use fab filter q3 all of the time but when I want a certain tone, when I want a certain flavour, I'm going to grab a Neve 1073 or an SSL 4K EQ and I'm going to boost the hell out of it because I want a particular sound imparted from that unit. So right here, we have the drum overheads. I've got this sort of pull tech style EQ from Slate, but then after it, I've got a Neve 1073. I'm adding some mid-range, about 3 dB, which on a Neve 1073 is brutal it's a hell of a lot and i'm also adding about 1.6 of high shelf and that just has a sound let's listen to what this is doing take the neve out back in Now these are only fairly subtle boosts, but because of the way the Neve is designed, it has a massive impact. Another example is the kick. We have three kick drums here, in, out, and sub. Let's take a look at the kick in. I love the SSL EQ here. I love SSL EQs just as a workhorse, but look how much we're boosting here. We've got a high shelf at 5K, and we're boosting nearly 9 dB. We've also got this pull textile EQ, and as you can see, we're adding all of the top end, all of the highs, and a lot of the lows as well. Let's take a listen to what this sounds like. Take those EQs out. And back in. Again, that is not a subtle difference. We're getting a lot more of the attack, a lot more of that kind of clicky beta sound from, from the kick, which we need in a really dense pop punk mix. And it's just getting rid of some of that muddiness. We've got huge highs. We've got a nice chunk of lows. We could have just grabbed Fab Filter or the Stock EQ and just dipped out some mids, but it wouldn't have sounded as good as that because the SSL has a really nice effect on the transients. The mid range saturates in a way that's really nice. And because we're boosting the mid range, it just helps us to get the sound that we want. And in my opinion, it just wouldn't have sounded good if we'd have took the EQ and would have subtracted the mids it, it would have sounded different so that's hopefully another piece of mixing advice that you can now ignore don't worry if you are boosting eqs all over the place even if you're adding 10 db altogether we're adding nearly 20 db of top end on this kick and you know what it sounds great nothing is set on fire it sounds really really good okay on to the fourth piece of terrible mixing advice uh, this is about using high pass filters all over the internet tutorials forums whatever you'll see people saying that you should always have a high pass filter on nearly every track maybe with the exception of the bass or the kick drum or something like that and again this is just total bs yes you should use a high pass if you need to but to just put a high pass on every single track just because someone on the internet says that you should 
It's bad advice and we shouldn't be doing it. Now, if you're recording in a less than ideal environment, maybe you're in an apartment, maybe there's road noise, yeah, you probably are going to have to filter some of that low end out. And you might end up finding that you need to high pass every single track. If that's what you need to do, fine, you do it. You do whatever it takes to sound good. But if you're recording in a room that's really well treated or a really nice studio, then you're going to probably find that you don't need to do that. I'm certainly not high passing every single track on here. There's a few that I am. But in some circumstances, I'm actually boosting a hell of a lot of low end that for some people, it might kind of make the toes curl. It might raise some eyebrows. But you know what? It sounds great. The mix sounds good. That's all that matters. I'm not going to stick a high pass filter on just because someone says that you should. So let's take a look at some examples of this. Now, I'm going to start with the lead vocal. I want the lead vocal to sound crisp. I want it to sound clear. So absolutely, we've got a high pass filter on that. We're filtering out some of those super deep lows up to around 75 hertz. So yeah, in this particular track, there was a little bit of super low end rumble that I didn't want there. I just wanted to clean it up. However, in another example, we're going to go back to the drums, specifically the snare. Now on the snare, we've got a top mic, we've got a bottom mic. A lot of people will filter all the lows of the bottom mic and they're just going to use it for the snap of the snare. However, something else that you also get in the bottom mic is bleed from the kick. Take a listen to this. This is just the raw sound of that bottom snare mic. Now, if we filter all the low end out, we're going to lose that. Why not use it if it's there? There's some quite nice punchy kick coming through that mic. It might not be the primary reason that we've used it. We still want to get the top end, the kind of shine from the snare, but we might as well not let that kick drum go to waste. So we've got our tape machine plug in like we talked about earlier, and then we've got our EQ. Now I am filtering out the super lows. I think this is set to about 30 hertz because really down there is just rumble from the mic stand moving about, from the drummer moving his feet and stuff like that. But then if you look over here, we've got a massive boost at just below 100 hertz and even more here. That's bringing out some of that punchiness from the kick. If we just filtered all the way up to 100, 200, 300, we're going to lose all of that. And then it's just a waste. So let's take a listen to what this sounds like now. That track is now going to really help the drum sound in two ways. We've got the brightness from the snare, but we've also got some punch from the kick. Let's see what happens if we took that high pass all the way up. All that low end, all that energy that we were getting from the kick is gone. It makes no sense to do that in my opinion. Now, another area is guitars. Take a listen to these rhythm guitars. This is just the raw recorded sound from the amp. Now those rhythm guitars sound great. The recording is absolutely pristine as well. However, I want the guitars to have more presence and I want the low end to sound even bigger than what it is now. I really want those guitars to fill the mix. The rhythm guitars, they need to sound fat and thick and chunky. There's zero reason to high pass those guitars. They sound great. So what I'm actually doing is I'm grabbing some EQ, I'm grabbing some tape and I'm boosting a hell of a lot of lows and highs. Again, this comes back to the subtractive EQ. We could just dip the mids, but actually I really like the sound of this EQ, this pull textile EQ, just adds something extra to the sound. And no high pass filter because it's just not needed. The recording sounds great. There's no rumble. There's nothing that we need to get rid of. So we're not going to do it just because. <laughs> Back to before. And with the EQ. And this leads me onto my ultimate piece of mixing advice that I can give you. And that is, don't do something in a mix just because. If something sounds great as it is, just leave it. Don't put a bunch of plugins on and feel like you have to change it. That's not your job as a mixer. Your job as a mixer is to get the best sound possible. And if it already sounds that good, then your job is to do nothing. Now, if you're a songwriter or you're in a band and you're releasing music in any way, shape or form, then very likely a problem that you don't have 
is a lack of ideas. In fact, probably quite the opposite. You've got a million song ideas floating around your head, probably hummed into the voice notes app on your phone. Well, the problem with this, every time you hum a new idea or a new hook, into that voice notes app of your phone, your old ones get pushed further and further down, potentially to get forgotten about forever. Or even worse, you switch your phone, you get a new device, and they're all lost in that transition. Well, I've come up with a solution to this problem. I've created a tool called the Songwriters Project Organizer. This is an app that you can use to keep every single one of your ideas safe and secure never to be lost, never to be forgotten about. Within the app, you can create different lists, so you can keep track of every single song idea, right from that initial idea, hook or melody, right through to finished, mixed, mastered, and released. Another one of my favorite features about this app as well is that it is completely collaborative. So maybe if you're working with another songwriter, you might be working with a producer, you might be collaborating with other artists, you can share this with anyone that you choose and everyone can keep track of every single project, whatever stage it's at. So it makes collaboration an absolute breeze. And also probably best of all, you can use this app on any device, whether you're on a phone, laptop or tablet, and it's completely free. So if you wanna try this out, you wanna make sure that you never forget or lose a great song idea ever again, check out the link in the description below. Go check out the Songwriters Project Organizer.